Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on COVID-19 lockdowns and their broader impacts, social costs and potential co-benefits. We are all experts in this. We've all experienced lockdowns. We've experienced stay at home orders. Working from home has been made obligatory. Schools and universities offer remote teaching. Many businesses from the hospitality industry to hairdressers have been affected by closures. All countries have experienced it, so some of them are already in the second lockdown, if not the third. And the measures taken vary as their implementation varies. These are drastic measures and they need to be justified vis-a-vis -vis the costs and benefits. So what are the main domains of impacts and how are they distributed over the population? Is there something we can learn from this positively? Are there potential co-benefits? We are not going to give final, final answers to this, but we will share with you how this is currently discussed in countries and um, governments. My name is Matthias Wismar. I'm a program manager with the European Observatory in Health Systems and Policies, and I'm your facilitator today. And I will guide you through the program and the session. Our keynote speaker today is Valentina Chiesa from Italy. She has been working with a public health unit of Reggio Emilia in Italy. And together with my colleague, Bernd Reckel, she has developed a review of reviews on the impacts of lockdowns. So she will give us an overview on what impacts are there and to what extent they affect the people. This will be followed by three spotlight speakers. We have lined up for you Liz Green from Public Health Wales in the UK. The Welsh government actually has commissioned a report on the impacts of the first lockdown. We will also have a presentation from Gabriel Antoni, Austria Public Health Institute. So there was a report uh, on the impacts commissioned by the cabinet of the health minister, and we will hear firsthand, you know, what are the preliminary results. And finally, from Germany, from the Public Health Institute of Northern Westphalia, Odile Mekel, there was no report um, commissioned, but of course, there are plenty of people and networks that do profound thinking and analysis on the topic and what sort of impacts we have seen from the lockdowns. So when we talk about lockdowns, let's make sure that we focus on the constructive bits. What can we learn from the evidence, in particular from the first wave of lockdowns? And is it possible to mitigate harsh consequences of lockdowns? Can we emphasize positive impacts, if any? So just let me say a couple of things on the housekeeping. We have a very, time, very tight um, time budget, and that is, of course, challenging for all speakers. Just three things. Please send us your questions and comments through the chat box. My colleague Erica will feed back the chat to us towards the end of the session. We are also going to record the video and we are planning to publish it later on on our YouTube channel. Finally, we will send you an evaluation form and we would kindly ask you to fill it in as it is very important for improving the quality of our webinars. This is the 12th webinar in the series. So stay tuned and tune in again next week when we will discuss COVID-19 and health financing, sustainability, and crisis budgets during the pandemic. Before we start with the keynote, I have asked my colleague Erica to uh, start a poll and please uh, make your choices. Erica, the floor is all yours. Yes, um, and Elisa, if we could uh, launch the poll. This is just a little bit of audience interaction. Um, it's not scientific or representative. It's just trying to find out uh, get a little bit of feedback from uh, you as attendees to see what you feel might be the most significant social costs from lockdown. So in terms of mental health impact, unemployment, disruption to education or increase in social inequalities, um, but also what the most significant potential co-benefits might be. So in terms of more flexible work patterns, reduced pollution, stronger local communities, or reduced road traffic. Now you can have more than one answer if you can't choose between them. But yes, please do feel free to let, to let us know in the poll uh, what you feel are the most, most significant potential benefits uh, and uh, negative impacts. Okay, and uh, Annalise is just gonna leave that up on the screen for you to uh, interact with while I hand back to Matthias to launch into the first speaker. 
Thank you so much, Erica. And as you say, we will uh, come back to the poll later on and uh, publish the results before the spotlight speakers. But first of all, to set the scene, we have our keynote speaker, Valentina. Valentina, the floor is all yours. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Valentina Chiesa. I'm a medical doctor from Italy. I'm going to present to you a systematic review of systematic review on the health impact of uh, the lockdown measure during the COVID pandemic. But what are these lockdown measures? Lockdown has become a common term across the world, especially during the last year. However, this term is not well defined. If the WHO director generals refer to the so-called lockdown uh, measures, as, and this indicates the absence of a clear and universally accepted definition. It is also important to stress that there's, uh, there are difficulties in uh, discriminating the lockdown and other control um, lockdown measure, infectious disease measure, sorry. In this scenario, we decided to perform a systematic review of systematic review on the health impact, both direct and indirect, uh, involving lockdown in general, social distancing, quarantine, isolation. And overall, we included 51 systematic reviews. Here you see the list of the direct health impact areas, starting from the first uh, researched area uh, is mental health. Here you see the distribution all over the world of the countries included in uh, the systematic review. The most researched uh, country is uh, China, followed by, for example, the US, uh, Canada, Australia, South Africa, the UK, uh, Spain, and so on. We retrieved overall 25 systematic review on 51 in this, uh, um, in this area. Concerning the top, uh, the type of lockdown measure, the most researched uh, um, lockdown measure connected to mental health uh, is quarantine, uh, followed by social distance and isolation. Uh, it is important to highlight that uh, the rapidity of uh, this lockdown measure can themselves uh, produce uh, anxiety and alarm. Uh, the evidence suggests an high burden of mental health issues, uh, in, in particular among patients, uh, among the general population and healthcare workers. Uh, and these include anxiety, depression, PTSD, stress, and stigmatization. Stigma is linked, for example, uh, to quarantine, quarantine and isolation, and it is uh, particularly experienced by healthcare workers and children. The second research topic is healthcare delivery. Uh, we retrieved uh, four systematic reviews on one side on the restriction of healthcare services, and these include the postponement, for example, of non-urgent outpatient visit and of non-urgent surgical intervention, the reduction of non-essential services, and the restriction in accessing the hospital for patients and their caregivers as well. Nine systematic review in uh, this area concern telemedicine as it is a potential key solution to overcome these healthcare delivery limitations. It has been applied to, to psychotherapy, orthopedic care, rehabilitation, and also urogynecology care. Concerning infection control, this area uh, concerned mostly uh, the effectiveness of this lockdown measure. We retrieved overall, overall uh, 12 systematic reviews. You see China is the most researched country, which is in black. And um, this is a synthesis. The lockdown of a city um, was proved to be effective in reducing the transmission, while other public health measures including uh, contact tracing, mask utilization, are uh, the most effective way uh, to um, control the spread of the virus, uh, prevent the collapse of the health services, and reduce the mortality if are used in combination and not alone. Concerning travel restriction, they may have a positive impact on infectious disease uh, control, but for example, the entry and exit symptom screening uh, on their own seems not to be so effective. And also the evidence is scant on the effectiveness of travel-related quarantine. It is very important to point out that the school closure do not seem to be effective and to contribute to the control of the pandemic. 
The third point uh, concerns children and children development. We retrieved only six systematic reviews. And uh, this point focus on the uh, adverse effect of school closure. And these include the, the increased risk of transmission of, from children to their grandparents, harms to child welfare, nutritional issue, and the loss of teaching and learning and socialization process. Social isolation in children may increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, reduce physical activity, activity and have negative effects on mental health. Also quarantine in children is linked to anxiety, stress, depression, and uh, may um, become a risk for children growth and development. Uh, surprisingly, a systematic review found that uh, during quarantine, despite the low quality of life, there's an increased desire for parenthood. But uh, it's not known if this is linked also to an increased uh, uh, birth rate. Older people and lockdown, you see in yellow uh, China and India, only five systematic reviews included. Uh, isolation and quarantine um, in uh, uh, older people suggests uh, an increased vulnerability, uh, an increased risk for impaired cognitive function, and the lockdown in general is linked to a reduction of the social participation of physical activities and thus the, uh, on an increase in uh, chronic disease in early. Well-being and quality of life. Uh, Quarantine in healthcare worker is linked uh, compared to the general population to an increased uh, risk of PTSD, stigma, avoidance behavior, loss of income, and also to um, a negative effect at the psychological level. While lockdown and social distancing in the general population is linked to negative psychological impact the fear of being infective, infected, and also the people were worried about their loved ones. Also substance abuse uh, we retrieved is linked to lockdown and social isolation and quarantine as a potential contributor to, to the aggravation of the substance abuse. Concerning violence abuse, these are linked uh, to lockdown. Uh, you see that the most reported countries are the US and also the UK and uh, the South, South Africa. There's a link between lockdown and domestic violence and abuse. And it seems that social isolation and quarantine increase the woman's vulnerability from one side and from the other increase the power and the control of abusers on the victims. The last uh, uh, topic on the direct health impact is on lifestyle and dietary habits, um, diet change during lockdown, and social isolation, especially in children, decrease the time devoted to sport, and this uh, um, and uh, an increase of the time spent in sleeping and spent in front of this uh, of screens, so computer, video games, and this uh, uh, may increase the risk of obesity and overweight in children. Here you see the indirect health impact of the lockdown measure. Uh, these include the economic and social impact, inadequate supplies, but also food and information and education. You see, I had to group these results as the literature is very scant uh, in, this, uh, um, in this area. The most researched uh, topic uh, concerned the economic impact followed by the social impact. Overall, we retrieved 16 systematic review. Uh, and, and these are mostly focused on the general population, healthcare workers, parents, and also students, medical students, residents, and so on. The lockdown measure, you know, that have important economic and social consequences. For example, quarantine is associated with the necessity to work, the fear of loss of income, loss of income, real, and the decline of the economic growth. And also some systematic review found that uh, uh, there were uh, inadequate supplies, of food and information. The third point, education, school closure was associated with a loss of teaching and learning and education. There's a social impact and economic harm on working parents, academic delay, curricular issues, especially for medical students and impact on daily life. 
Concluding, in general, this turn of and on of uh, lockdown measures seems to be influenced by economic and political reason rather than uh, epidemiological um, uh, issues. It was sometimes difficult for us to ascertain whether the impact was due to the pandemic itself or, or the lockdown measure. Uh, we faced methodological challenges as uh, uh, in some, uh, some narrative review um, are uh, defined as systematic review in the literature and vice versa. Some systematic review conclusion are drawn on a very um, low quality evidence and also in other the impact of the lockdown measure is mainly described in the introduction section of the paper rather than in the result section we face also terminological challenges as uh, as i stated before there is not an unique uh, definition of lockdown measures and uh, so there's a need for more terminological clarity. Some authors, for example, misuse the term isolation and quarantine. Others confuse social isolation with isolation. Almost uh, the half we retrieved explored the impact of the lockdown measure um, related to mental health. And uh, these have been followed by those on healthcare delivery. These last are focused mostly on telemedicine. The impact of the lockdown measure uh, is more efficient if these are applied together in combination. Other policy areas, uh, so the indirect health impact uh, on social determinants of health have received little attention. But one important conclusion of policy relevance is that the impact of this measure uh, can have on health both direct or indirect uh, effects. Therefore, policymakers in the policy making pro process should consider both direct and indirect impacts and intended and unintended consequences. I concluded and uh, thank you for your attention. Well, Tina, thank you so much. I think that was a great presentation that, that gave us, first of all, a wonderful overview over the different areas of impact, but also what sort of impacts are to be expected. And already a couple of hints on the on the hopefully more, more positive side, but I would like to take three things with, with me. First of all, thank you for much, so much. At the end, you were also emphasizing some of the methodological question, but I think that your review, even though you are very critical of some of it, your review has the advantage that it is a review of reviews. So yeah. publications that already have had some quality check. I mean, the literature is exploding and there's a lot of very low quality out there. And I think you have managed to get a lot of very good stuff together. Second thing is that I'm not quite sure if I'm wrong on this one, but I was a bit concerned that in some cases, there were not so many reviews actually coming from, from Europe. I mean, we're talking a lot about it. We are having a very hard time, probably harder than some of the Asian countries actually. And the research seemed to be so, uh, well, kind of uh, lukewarm responding to it, at least in terms of review of uh, reviews. And the third one is, I think, you know, many of the issues which concern our, all of us, you know, you've made very, very tangible, like uh, the worries about old people, the travel restrictions, the schools, is it effective? And you already can see that there are interactions between the different impacts, actually, you know, you, you, you're worried about the older people, you want to travel to them, it doesn't work, and, and so on. So there's quite uh, some complexities in this. So thank you so much, Valentina. We'll um, uh, uh, link up to you later on for the panel discussion. Okay. Erica. Um, what about the poll? Can we see the results? Hello there. Yes, thank you. So here are the results. We've heard what the reviews have found, um, but what about our audience? So um, the people have been very clear that it's about the mental health impact and increased social inequalities as being the really most significant social costs. Perhaps more interestingly, when it comes to the co-benefits, people are very much saying, yes, yes, flexible work patterns. But it's notable that the potential positive environmental impacts are seen as uh, less significant. So that might be something that we should really come back to in the discussion to find out what's behind that. Thank you very much. 
very interesting that uh, the audience is very aware of the increased social inequalities and maybe we can pick up on this during the following talks and in the panel discussion a little bit. Erica, thank you so much for presenting the poll. So let's go to Wales. Let's go to our next uh, spotlight speaker. Liz, please, the floor is all yours. Uh, I'm uh, Liz Green. I'm Programme Director for Health Impact Assessment at Public Health Wales. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, the Welsh version of lockdown, because as Valentina said, there's different types. Uh, and we've called it staying at home and social distancing policy. Um, Wales is one of four UK devolved nations, um, and therefore it has control of its own health policy. Um, and so in this instance, although all the four nations of the UK had some version of lockdown, um, the Welsh version was slightly different. Um, so there was a staying at home decree, uh, population was only allowed out once a day for exercise, that's from your home, you're allowed out for specific circumstances such as to go get supplies, a medical uh, appointment for example, uh, and all the, all the, all the non-essential services such as retail, hospitality were closed down, schools were closed down. Um, and so that's the kind of context. So we were commissioned at Public Health Wales to try and better understand the actual wider impact of this policy in Wales. And we captured it in real time as part of the first lockdown that uh, was uh, implemented from the end of March. And in Wales, we've tended to have longer impact, uh, longer lockdowns, and they've been stricter lockdowns. And so although the health impact assessment has captured information and data from April to uh, May, which was the sort of first six weeks of the lockdown in Wales, the actual lockdown itself didn't really end until the start of August. Uh, and it sort of lessened in it, it, it diminished in its sort of uh, restrictions ongoingly from about June onwards. So the health impact assessment we carried out um, looked at both positive impacts uh, and any opportunities for the future, as well as any negative or une unintended negative impacts. Because with the best will in the world, policies have a good intention, but sometimes they have unintended negative impacts. The HIA was comprehensive. It engaged stakeholders, it had a literature review, but also, uh, and data health intelligence, but also um, Public Health Wales was capturing public information and opinion on a daily basis as part of a public engagement survey. Uh, and we use that as some of our evidence as well. And that was a, a very rich form of data for us. The health impact assessment looked at who was affected in the population and how they were affected. So that social determinant lens. And I'm gonna tell you about what the major impacts were. The first thing to know um, is actually that what we looked at was the who, who did it affect the policy? And it was a protective measure for all groups. Um, but one of the things that did become quite clear is that you'll see on the left of the screen, those who are directly affected by mortality and morbidity, so older people, black minority ethnic groups, those with pre-existing conditions and those in deprived areas. But what the health impact assessment did was also starkly show that there were not only synergies with that, so some of those same groups were affected negatively by the lockdown, such as older people, but there was also a huge range of population groups who were negatively affected, but actually were not severely affected through the actual illness itself. So children and young people, young adults, those on low incomes, many who were furloughed, so they were provided economic assistance because they worked in the sectors that were closed down. Uh, and women, for example, we, we um, uh, came to understand that women were significantly negatively affected by lockdowns because they were either furloughed because they worked in those sectors that were closed down, such as hospitality, leisure, or non-essential retail. They were often picking up the caring responsibilities of homeschooling uh, or, or childcare in the house environment. They were always often looking after or, or carers for elderly parents or those who were at risk. Um, or conversely, 
the women who were working in Wales worked in three public or patient facing um, services. So 47% of the women who are employed in Wales work in health and social care or education and childcare, or for example, supermarket retail, which were classed as essential services. The impacts that were identified, those in the red are those that are negative or unintended negative, and those in the green text are those that were positives or could be opportunities. And Valentina has well described some of these already, such as the impacts on mental well-being, social isolation, uh, the economic inactivity, uh, and the impact on those on low incomes. So if you are in a sector that's closed down and you're only on 80% of your income, then you know that can lead to full food and fuel poverty, particularly at times like now in the winter, when you are required to stay at home, but actually you need to have your heating on uh, and you need to uh, use all your appliances uh, for homeschooling and laptops and things like that. Um, the economic inactivity, under the Welsh government policy structures, home working or remote working and digital media uh, was uh, is classified under that. And it's in blue text because there are actually positive impacts to home working, um, such as flexibility, um, which was highlighted in the poll. Uh, but actually, for those who live and work on their own, or those who have caring responsibilities, then personal circumstances mean that home working isn't ideal, particularly if you're having to homeschool as well as many, many parents are. Uh, digital media use has brought together society, friends, Zoom parties, but actually if you're an older person and you don't have a smartphone or you're not digitally literate, then actually that can lead to social exclusion for you as well, and that can lead to many, many challenges. And Wales is uh, both um, ur urban, uh, it has a small number of cities across the South, South Wales, but actually it's hugely uh, rural as well. And that can lead to difficulties um, in your experience and lead to challenges um, of your experience of lockdowns and staying at home, for example, or uh, accessing services. Um, in terms of the positives, there were high levels of compliance in Wales and the Public Health Wales engagement survey showed that 71% of people in the first sort of month had high trust in the police that they would enforce uh, the lockdown and do it well uh, and in, in a trustful way. There were economic support measures, Welsh Government put in a wide range of support uh, packages to support small business owners to small, those in the sectors that were closed down. Um, but also there was an increase we saw in community cohesion and social mobilization. And 27% who, who were asked in the Public Health Wales engagement survey said that they were volunteering for the first time and they were actively supporting the third sector. Uh, and we saw reduced homelessness. So the streets were cleared of rough sleepers in Wales for the first time. And those who were classified as homeless were provided shelter um, in some form by their local authorities. Um, so there were also opportunities for the future we identified. So uh, home working, um, it could have a positive impact in terms of environmental benefits, flexible practices, work-life balance, and Welsh government um, took the subsequent home working HIA that we carried out and are using that as a basis of some of their remote working plans going forward. Um, and we've, we realised that actually there is a lot of resilience in some of the systems in place, particularly healthcare and the use of telehealth, and it could lead to more sustainable models of working. Um, and the other thing that we identified was that there were huge research gaps and evidence gaps and so therefore we're trying to fill that and that's the impact on children and young people and we're currently carrying out a mental well-being impact assessment on the impact of COVID uh, in Wales on children and young people. Um, we put in some monitoring of the impact and the policy uh, and that's currently ongoing. Um, we wanted to ensure that mental well-being is high up uh, as a consideration and also the needs and views of children and young people 
um, were considered in order to mitigate the potential long-term impact, for example, on their future education and economic employment um, uh, opportunities. Uh, and finally, I'm using this as, a, uh, as part of a, 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 a piece of work around the triple challenge of Brexit and climate change, which I think we also need to consider uh, in the context of COVID-19. So thank you very much. Liz, thank you so much. That was really great. After we had the overview from Valentina, you were zooming in really into Wales and you've done a lot of research and also interviews asking people directly. And to some extent, I felt, you know, it was almost an answer to the poll because first of all, you know, uh, the first impact on your list was mental health impact. And then you uh, dealt quite extensively actually with the unequal distribution of the impacts of the lockdowns over different parts of the society. And I thought that was uh, very, very um, interesting. Also the, the positive effects you've been talking about, but I always wonder you know, whether we will be able to retain those positive effects and whether the flexibilities we've seen in some cases, um, you know, will be um, retained after the, the crisis. Thank you so much. We come back to Wales and your assessment of the situation in the panel discussion. I would like to invite now um, the second um, um, spotlight speaker from Austria, Gabriela, please. The floor is all yours. As introduced, I'm working at the Austrian Public Health Institute and we have, or we are still um, in doing this health impact assessment, we're in the finishing phase now. But at first, to setting the scene, a few words of introduction. We had our first lockdown in Austria from the 16th of March until the 14th of April, or even at the 2nd of May, because there were some softer opening steps. And then in May, there were the other steps going down with <coughs> workshops and so on. So, and in summer, there was a discussion about collateral damages, which focuses almost on healthcare services and um, what these damages were caused by the lockdown of non essential services in healthcare. So, as this discussion was going on, there was the, the impression that there were other collateral damages as well on the social uh, effects or on, on other areas of life. So the cabinet of the Minister of Health commissioned us to, to do this health impact assessment on positive and negative impact, uh, impacts on health in a broader perspective as it was done in Wales. So the research, research question was, what were positive and negative impacts of the lockdown and social distancing policy to contain COVID-19 on health in the population in Austria and in particular on health equity? So as you see, the duration was, um, it start, we started in October, 2020 and still are in this finalizing phase where we have our report under review. So um, as we followed the HIA process, we've gathered our information mostly from literature and the survey we've conducted. So in the literature research, we've researched um, on databases, but also on web, websites of relevant institutions to gather this gray literature, as we heard before, that there is not that much, much on systematic reviews um, here. And even when we focus on Austria, there is a lot of gray literature, which you won't be able to find in databases. So, and we've also um, conclu um, given the focus on Germany and Switzerland, as we thought there were a comparable context there. And we have this cooperation with the European Observatory on, on having this international literature review as we've heard from uh, in the beginning. So then we thought there might be some limited findings in the literature regarding some areas of life. So we've set up a survey which um, was highly interrelated to the interview guidelines which were used in Wales to collect observations and experiences from organizations that work in Austria with some populational groups, especially vulnerable groups, to get to know 
the effects or impacts on the lives of their target groups and what they've observed in the field. And we've included also some experts in public health and relevant corona research on this survey. And it was like three weeks open to do the survey there and we've got 260 responses. So there was quite an interest to tell us what they had um, observing in this phase. So uh, one thing I had to add when we are having the survey online, we're focusing our research on the first impact in March and April, but then we're going to the second lockdown. So the um, results may be a bit interlinked or in compared to the two lockdowns, but afterwards we've done some clusters um, for thematically clusters to discuss our findings with some experts from science practice and public administration in appraisal workshops as it is set out in the HIA methodology. So we've identified the clusters to family, education and training, work, healthcare, nursing and long-time care, physical health, social aspects and psychosocial health, and also economy and environment sustainability, but there were not that much findings in our literature and also in the survey. And there were other expert institutions working on this. So we focused on the first four clusters here. Then we drew up these online appraisal workshops with two, uh, three hours time, which we thought would be quite um, a time to discuss these impacts as we saw that we have, should have had more time. But I think it was a good way to include um, experts from science and practice and public administration as well to discuss our findings. So, and in this meeting, we also had started to collect initial recommendations. So some preliminary results and learnings I want to share with you. We have also found positive and negative impact in literature and in our survey, um, but more negative impacts. What we've also saw is that populational groups were affected differently in some areas. For example, when we're looking at home office, as Liz also mentioned, there were some who would say there are positive impacts on um, work-life balance and so on. But there are also groups which would say there are more negative impacts which also is um, related to what are your personal resources. So um, we saw that often groups that were already disadvantaged before the pandemic are more affected by negative impacts of the measures, especially socially economically disadvantaged groups. And that's not new, but it's also here to say that the affected areas or impacts are often interrelated to other areas of life. So when we're talking about job loss, it's all it's in mostly connected to mental health and also physical activity and mental health are connected to each other. And as we mentioned before, these are these direct and indirect impacts which are interrelated here in this. So it's also a need for having these integrated assessments where you could take the um, view on all areas of life and discuss it with the, the experts. So, and at last, I think there is a need for further research, especially for specific vulnerable groups in specific area. We've got this broad overview for Austria, but I think there is a, quite a lot where you can dig into with another research. So, Thank you so much for that and back to you, Matthias. Gabriela, thanks a lot for this overview on the preliminary results. And I think it's great that um, your research has been informed by the research done in Wales because that allows us for much more um, discussion and interaction between these two, two pieces. It's also very interesting to see that some of the results Liz was presenting, you are actually echoing, I'm just making the uh, example of the home office um, work. I think we will need to talk in the um, uh, panel discussion a little bit about the motivation of governments to issue this sort of um, uh, impact assessment. But before we go 
to our panel discussion. I would like to um, invite Odile from Germany to talk a little bit about impact assessment or not impact assessment in Germany. Odile, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias, uh, for handing over. So we saw earlier that uh, governments were commissioning work to do health impact assessment. In Germany, we have a different situation. Uh, the work I'm presenting on behalf of the group uh, is uh, done in the context of um, the competence network public health COVID-19. Next slide, please. And this competence network uh, was established as a novelty in Germany that um, as the lockdown started in the middle of March, um, then uh, colleagues uh, around Germany uh, uh, organized themselves in an ad hoc uh, initiative consortium where uh, more than 25 uh, scientific societies and organizations uh, are working together to uh, provide interdisciplinary uh, expertise on COVID-19 uh, and um, to uh, compile and process scientific information and uh, in order to disseminate it in a, a way that can be understand not only by us uh, researchers or uh, policy uh, advisors but also uh, for other uh, for the policy makers uh, so we um, have different uh, the competence network has different formats so statements papers uh, or methodological summaries uh, and Starting uh, middle of March, uh, the network started to work at the structures uh, fixed uh, already uh, in the first week of April. Uh, I put in the uh, link to, uh, to the network, uh, to the website where you can find it. And I'm talking, uh, so on the next slide, you will see that uh, a lot of um, groups are working uh, in this competence network. Uh, currently, we have 15 working groups uh, and topics uh, uh, as you can see here, and um, in the beginning, uh, so I'm um, a member of the group Indirect Health Consequences of Infectious Control Measures. Please click again, uh, Marcella. Yes, over there. And um, so we started with uh, two, three groups, and now we have 15, uh, and uh, all of these groups are really very active. Uh, they produce papers uh, now. Uh, up to date, we have almost more than 50 papers published, mainly in German, but uh, also uh, quite a few papers in English. Uh, for example, the working group on ethics uh, only produces uh, the papers in English. Um, and um, what you can also see over here, you see that different determinants or different aspects of uh, of the lockdown uh, or the pandemic, uh, to be honest, uh, the, of the pandemic is uh, tackled by different uh, working groups. Uh, so my few minutes I have uh, on the next slide, um, I want to show you so the group, uh, the working group and direct health effects. They, we focus initially, uh, or we focus in this group on uh, economic, social and environmental determinants of health. Uh, and so it is not like, um, like Austria and Wales that we uh, sat down and uh, looked at different groups who are affected or different determinants uh, so that we did a full-blown uh, HIA for this, uh, but it was more on also the, uh, the expertise of the uh, colleagues who are in this group. Uh, and first of all, we um, colleagues were um, digging in into the findings from previous economic crisis. So what can we learn from them for this uh, currently uh, crisis, but also so more on the um, social determinants, uh, unemployment or uh, precarious employment, social inequalities and the environmental health. So um, similar like um, Austria and Wales, um, we did literature review and also um, Valentina showed uh, and also meta analysis, but also uh, we looked at systematic reviews and uh, but also individual studies and all these four topics you see on the top um, separate, uh, separate papers were um, published were, um, were worked out uh, in April, May. Um, 
these papers were published and uh, till July uh, this summer. And uh, we also produced an integrated paper uh, where all the um, findings and the uh, were put together into uh, an integrated way. And in that one, um, it's the, the main main um, recommendation is uh, strengthening the health in all policies approach on local on different levels. And Germany is quite large, so on local, regional, national, but also international level. Uh, and <clears throat> think about uh, so the recommendations uh, are given also to uh, to think about a recovering recovery uh, back to uh, a recovery. So using the opportunities for sustainable green but also in health promoting uh, transformation uh, of our economy and society so on the last slide you will see all the people who are worked in this particular smaller group so the working group on indirect uh, effects of uh, the pandemic and on the right side you see my contact details and i give the floor to the discussion i really you. interested to receive Thank you so much, Odile. And uh, your recommendations remind me of the words of a very famous uh, British policymaker who said, never let the good crisis go to waste, uh, but rather <laughs> make recommendations on health impact, health, health in all policies and intersectorality and all these issues we want to, to move forward. I hope that your request will be heard. So this is now the moment, you know, to feed back a couple of comments from the chat box. Erica, how have we done actually? Have we received some comments? Yes, yes, there's been quite a lot of activity in the uh, chat box, quite a few specific questions, but actually I think they have a much broader connotation. So uh, one of our colleagues in Ireland was asking about, uh, was the messaging in Wales differently? So because compliance was pretty good in all three of these countries. Um, was the messaging different in Wales? Was it about stay home to protect the NHS or was there something else going on there? But given the that compliance was pretty good in all three countries that we've got today, it'd be interesting to see what the messaging was. Why were people being told to stay home? What was the public health messaging around that? Um, were lessons learned from the first lockdown going into the second or in our case, third lockdown? Um, did people learn from the negative impacts and put things in place to mitigate the negative impacts? Um, has there been a big impact, all this COVID work on uh, non-COVID public health work? Has what, What's the impact there been? Um, and I'm going to be very naughty and ask a question myself, which is when we talk about sort of homelessness, food poverty, fuel poverty and things like this, should we really just go to the very basic social determinants of health and just talk about poverty as being one of the really big issues here? So that was that's just my question. So let's do another round after this. So colleagues, just one question, then we have another round. Liz, please start. No, no, Valentina, please start. So the question is related to poverty and lockdown. We retrieved, especially in low and middle in income countries, that there's a sort of difficulties in complying uh, with certain lockdown measure, uh, for example, and that there's a sort of, um, as the majority of people work in informal setting, such as in uh, West Africa, and uh, this job, it is important to underline that are not subject to social protection, and therefore they have very strong difficulties in following these lockdown measures. Uh, I just wanted to underline another point uh, that some of the um, presenter have something in common. Uh, for example, the digital intervention. I mentioned uh, uh, digital intervention applied to telemedicine. Leeds uh, and uh, Gabriele, digital intervention uh, applied to smart working. And my question <laughs> to you is, do you think that this... Uh, um, could be applied to the future, to this sort of normal future we have to accept it. Is it clear, my question? Valentina, I think that the audience is rather hoping for answers from your side. So um, I'm not quite sure who should answer this. But maybe we move on to, to Liz, actually. Liz, there was also quite uh, specific questions to Wales and uh, 
Also, yeah. Wales seems to have a very nice population, very compliant. Yes, yes, we did actually. Um, and the question in the chat box was um, around sort of what was the messaging? Uh, and the messaging actually was stay at home, stay safe so that you don't actually, uh, you know, catch the uh, catch COVID-19 yourself, but also reduce the stress on the NHS and the public services system uh, and primarily around protecting the NHS, the National Health Service capacity in Wales. Um, and I think it was very much that kind of message that came through. And then there was also another question that I can answer, which was around, did the work actually influence the sort of further lockdowns? And actually our health impact assessment has been acknowledged by Welsh government as helping them inform their decision-making around second and third lockdowns because we're in our third now in wales um, and the second one in october was called the fire break and actually schools and educational childcare facilities remained open for that oh wow. so congratulations break. liz that you work so, um, the... and that that's been interesting and also the home working aspect uh, welsh government have been really keen to understand more about remote and agile working mm. and i think it goes to valentina's question about well what will that will we see more of that in the future maybe and we will definitely definitely see that and welsh government have laid out planning for at least a third of the population in the future to work from home or remote work from a local hub for example thank you so much liz uh, gabriella yeah, um, thank you. I want also to comment on this um, aspect of first lockdown, second lockdown. We're also in our third lockdown at the moment in Austria. But um, even if it was not our work, which were given to the policymakers and do their decision for second lockdown, we just observed that there was just some adjustments also done, like Liz mentioned, about schools. Also in Austria, there was no complete um, closure of the schools in the second lockdown. There was more, more like an adjusted form to age groups and so on. So there was development between these uh, lockdowns and there was learning. And so we've discussed our results in front of these learnings and what the experts observed. And also in the recommendations for the future, it was like in first lockdown, we had this sort of policy, then it changed and there are further Changement may be needed to have a more positive um, impact on, on this sort. And I think I, I will stop at this point. Thanks, Gabriel. But that's quite encouraging because, you know, if there's some learning from previous uh, experience and on such a short notice, that's really great. Odile, please. <clears throat> so the situation in Germany is that we, uh, that the German uh, government, uh, put a huge amount of uh, money in to finance this whole lockdown uh, issues. And uh, they also look uh, specifically at uh, people who are having uh, not a good jobs. So, so they try to do, uh, it's not everything perfect, but uh, you know, everyone is struggling uh, how to cope uh, with this. Uh, and um, currently we have uh, a large discussion also about school openings and kindergartens because that's intertwined. Uh, people who work at home or need to work at home, it's uh, not so easy to do it uh, with uh, kids around. Uh, so that's an issue. And I think uh, all of the parents who are struggling with this uh, uh, will uh, know this uh, and uh, so they try to reopen uh, kindergartens and schools as soon as possible uh, so that's uh, one of the issues uh, and also uh, home office uh, is an issue that's really now on high on the agenda in Germany so we will get changes uh, in the uh, in the future uh, so that more people are working from home Thanks, Odila. I think the financial support you mentioned is very important to mitigate the consequences of the lockdown. And it's exactly what Valentina said, that if you don't have social protection, if you, for example, don't have sick pay, you go sick to your workplace and you infect other people. And I think that is uh, one of the lessons which is really need to be learned by everyone. One quick round, Erica, maybe one, one, one question very quickly. 
Okay, so time for one question. Um, and I think it's going to go back to the idea. So is COVID providing the great opportunity to get social determinants of health and equity on the political agenda? Is this our big window of opportunity? And especially looking forward to the sort of double threat of, you know, the impact of climate change as well as COVID or yep. and Brexit as well for Wales and the UK, the rest of the UK. So what are our thinkings of that? Is this our big opportunity? Good question, Eric. Uh, please, Valentina, very quick response, even though it's a huge topic. Okay, I think at, at the European level, um, we have to retrieve the key strategies to uh, adapt to this new concept of normality, and uh, especially to protect uh, um, vulnerable population, also in terms uh, of vaccination against COVID. And so also national plans should include the minorities, migrants, and other vulnerable population um, to protect them. Okay, so uh, after the crisis will be before the crisis or the crisis is the norm, new normality and we will need to incorporate some of the things we are already doing now. Liz, please. Yeah, so yes, I do. Um, I do think that it's a huge opportunity for us because public health is now at the top of the agenda um, and it's had a very clear focus on it. And I think that gives us that opportunity to better understand those wider determinants and the social impacts, but also the um, disproportionate impact that it can have on some particular groups in terms of health equity and what we need to do about it to readdress that balance. Excellent, Liz. Thank you so much. Gabriela. Yeah, I also think there is a quite huge window of opportunity and we should use it, even that the discussion isn't turning into an, you know, sort of old public health discussion where we're talking about vaccines and so on, but it's our turn to stay there and say there are the wider determinants of health and how we can tackle it and what there is done and how they are interrelated. So I think this is very important because uh, public health professionals, public health scientists sometimes had a minor role actually in um, the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic and also the vaccine rollout. And I think we must be much more, much better heard and we need to raise our voice. Odile, very briefly. So before I had something on top of my head and now it's lost, but uh, yeah, what I now know is uh, social determinants, yes, but also the environmental determinants. So I have, I fear that uh, the Green Deal, um, I don't know if uh, we all apply to it, stick to it again, uh, climate change. So uh, no, it's a bit, uh, so I'm... Um, so it's much more like uh, not only the social determinants, but a one health approach, which takes into account both environment, yeah. social and uh, yeah. economic. Very good. I would now like to invite my colleague Bernd Reckel, who has done the research on the review of reviews together with Valentina. Bernd, your observations, just uh, two or three sentences very briefly for wrapping up. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Matthias. Thanks for uh, all the presenters for the excellent presentations and to the attendees for the uh, very good questions. Um, I think uh, people from lots of countries were able to uh, find themselves in these experiences that were described in the presentations. And uh, if there's one the most important takeaway message uh, from this session today is probably that we have to keep an eye on uh, monitoring and evaluating the health impact of these measures and to integrate health in uh, all the policies that are being uh, taken. Um, I think that is really the main Thank message so to much, take away. Bernd, and I think we had a great example from Wales and also a quite good example from Austria on this one. And we can only hope that this linkage between research and policy making will further be strengthened. So thank you so much. Thank you for attending this webinar. Thank you to all the speakers. And we hope to see you back next week, Tuesday, 12 o'clock. Tune in. We will talk about sustainability, financing, COVID-19. Bye-bye. Take care.